Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got one heck of a show for you today. It is episode 100, 100, 100, 100. We have our 100th episode that we are doing today, and we got the whole gang here together. We, uh, Of course, we, we have to do our job here, so our topic today is going to be tree fruit with Andrew Holsinger. Um, a long-time recurring guest that we have here on the show. And uh, obviously, I cannot do this by myself. Joined, as always, by local foods educator Katie Parker and Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I am doing fantastically. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Can you believe we've made it 100 episodes? That seems like quite a milestone. I mean, right? it, 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 t- it felt like it took a while to get here. But I don't know, it's only been, what, two and a half years now that we've started this endeavor? I guess so. Uh, We started during the beginning of COVID, so that's crazy to think that this has been going on two and a half years. Amazing things coming out of COVID, everything from COVID babies to podcasts, Mm -hmm. the Good Growing Podcast. So uh, someone who I, I don't think he's got any COVID babies, but we'll find out. A horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey Ken. Hello. No, no COVID babies for me. <clears throat> oh. And I've I've gotten over my disappointment of not being your first guest. So I am back this week. I I know. I apologize. Uh, we we just aired our unaired episode of uh, when I first tried to do podcasting and didn't do a very good job at it. But I figured, listeners, you deserve to hear it anyway. So uh, it's it's still a good show. Uh, where we learn about human health impacts on, sorry, nature on the impact of human health. I'll get this right one of these days, 100th episode, 200th, whatever. So, well, guys, we also have to introduce uh, our special, always kind of here guest, but she's, she's always kind of there in the background, our producer, Wendy Ferguson. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Kind of weird being on this side of the camera. (laughs) <laughs> I, I like having the uh, anonymity <laughs> well, it's always I, nice to see you <laughs> it is good to see you wendy we're happy that you're i here am a real person <laughs> <laughs> not just the voice not a disembodied voice <laughs> well guys we have a a lot to cover today we're going to be talking tree fruit plus i have a little surprise for you here at the end of the show so nobody knows what's going to happen and it could fall flat on its face but that's that's how we run things here at Good Growing. So um, we have to introduce our very popular recurring guest here that we have on the show. I don't know. I'd say he's here like, what, once a month? Uh, you know, we need to get this guy on payroll. Uh, we have horticulture educator Andrew Holsinger. Andrew, welcome back to the show. Hey, always good to be here. And look, I made it for the hundredth. How about that? <laughs> we are here. We've made it. Um we'll book you for the 200th. Okay. That sounds great. Sounds good. Only two and a half years to get there. So, oh yeah. So Andrew, we're going to be talking about tree fruit today, and this is a really timely topic uh, to cover here, but I have to redirect this to Ken. Ken plays a big role here at the state of Illinois and um, uh, captaining our tree fruit growers (laughs) in, in knowledge. And Ken, you have recently uh, helped out in organizing the Illinois Tree Fruit School. So what in the world is that? Uh, Do you get a four-year degree when you're done? Um, Did you learn anything? Say, I noticed none of you were there at the Tree Fruit School. Oh, boy. (laughs) Uh, So Tree Fruit School is an annual program we do uh, down in Calhoun County. Uh, That's where we have a lot of peach and apple growers, primarily peach, but also apple growers down there. Um, so we do updates on management practices, uh, disease, insect management, uh, we'll talk about pruning some years, uh, nutrition, kind of everything that goes into producing tree fruit. Um, so that was, it was a couple weeks ago. So um, it was good to be back in person this year. We, we did virtual last year. Um, so this year we did, we did our typical um, disease updates uh, with Muhammad Babadus. He's our extension pathologist for specialty crops. Uh, so talked about some of his research with brown rot in peaches and some of the summer fruit rots uh, and apples. So working on some different uh, management strategies 
different spray combinations to to try to manage some of those because they're becoming more and more of a problem with a lot of our growers. Uh, so this was kind of first year research. So hopefully by next year after this summer, um, we'll have some kind of some conclusive strategies that people can use. Uh, we had Casey Athey, who is our new extension entomologist for specialty crop stocking uh, about uh, mating disruption um, and other kind of ways of managing insect pests without the use of pesticides. Uh, so just briefly, mating disruption is using typically for most tree fruit pests is going to be using the pheromones, sex pheromones from females to draw in males. Um, and, and basically you release, you have lures that release all this pheromone. It confuses the males so they can't mate, which will uh, reduce hopefully the amount of egg laying that goes on uh, in your orchard. Uh, or they had, could just hire me to act as the male's wingman whenever they're out at the bar <laughs> looking for females. Uh, I'm a good mating disruptor as well. Next time I talk to some of the growers, I'll let them know. <laughs> there you go. Just have <laughs> me come out available. to the orchard. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then another person we had, uh, we had Brad Taylor with Southern Illinois University uh, talking about some nutrition uh, with tree fruit, which I thought was, was good. We hadn't done that um, in several years. Um, so it was good to hear some of that. Uh, talking a lot about um, the the need, especially for commercial growers, to do uh, foliar testing. Uh, so taking leaf samples and testing those for the nutrients, you can kind of see what nutrients the plants are taking up. Soil tests are great, but it doesn't tell you what the plants are taking up. Uh, so doing those foliar tests, you can see, give you a little bit better picture of what's going on. Um, a lot of times people are putting on phosphorus all the time, and that can inhibit some different nutrients like uh, zinc and stuff. Some of the, the stuff he's been looking at um, show that, you know, some of these trees, a lot of these trees are having zinc deficiencies because of excess phosphorus and stuff. Uh, so looking at reducing, or in some cases, eliminating phosphorus fertilization, at least for a couple of years to kind of rectify that. Um, and then talking about doing some foliar uh, fertilizer applications uh, to get that in to address some of those deficiencies uh, and stuff later in the year. And then we had uh, one more talk. We had uh, Patrick Byers with University of Missouri Extension talking about chestnut production. Uh, so talking about some different ways that growers could potentially diversify uh, their their orchards and stuff and get into to a new crop if they wanted. That's a lot of information there that can be retained from that that session so is this something that happens every year can you mention we were virtual a couple of years ago so would people if someone wants to attend next time just look out for information or happening yep. in february yeah february we usually do it early february um yearly at least as of now <laughs> we're still planning on doing it yearly um and you know, another good one, if, if you're doing tree fruit, is um, the specialty crops conference that happens in early January uh, in Springfield. And it, even though this stuff is geared towards kind of commercial growers, as a homeowner, you're still going to have the same pests and diseases. Um, some of the chemicals you use are going to be different, but the you know under, when they're talking about the biology and the damage they cause and what to look for, that's still going to apply to you. Interesting. Well, we always seem to promote soil testing, but I like this foliar tissue testing idea. I feel like we learn a lot from those. So, yeah, and really you're saying that's that's a, that's an annual thing. Do that yearly, whereas mm -hmm. a soil test you do, you know, every two, three, four years. Very cool. Well, Andrew, you're still here. Oh my I'm gosh, I think we, we covered everything. So, thank you so much. For, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. So let us dive into this topic of, of tree fruit, really. So some of these questions that we have solicited from the interwebs, and Katie, would you mind kicking us off, please? So Andrew, is now a good time to start pruning trees, or when is the best time to get started with that? Yeah, now is a good time to think about pruning your fruit trees, because we are in the dormant season. And so while these trees are still dormant and uh, not having leaves that's a good aspect of seeing the architecture of the tree and seeing what branches may be in conflict and so you can examine your tree find out uh, what branches may have uh, a poor branch angle uh, the wider the better to retain that strength in the limb 
And for apple trees, you want a good horizontal growing surface. And so the more horizontal, the more productive your tree will be. And so typically we look for methods of pruning that are gonna increase the productivity of the tree and lessen the burden of the weight of the fruit throughout the season so you don't have breakage of limbs and you keep the most productive tree you can. All right, let's talk diseases real quick here. Uh, so winter and early spring is a good time to do some disease management. And there's some diseases where really that's the only time you can uh, do anything about them. So let's talk about some of those. So first off, peach leaf curl. What should we be doing this time of year for that? Well, peach leaf curl, that's the classic, uh, has to be done when the leaves are not on. So even in the fall, after the leaves have departed, you can uh, start spraying for peach leaf curl at that time of the season, but you definitely want to have it wrapped up before the leaves come back on because you can have a phytotoxic injury to the trees. And that's uh, part of the problem that you have is you want to spray at the most opportune time, whether it's a, a fungicide or an insecticide to where you have your timing down. And there's a lot of timing that goes into it with the phenology of the trees as they progress from the buds to the blooms. You want to be sure that you're targeting uh, the appropriate fungicides and insecticides and reading those labels and uh, getting out there and scouting for some of these pests or fungus that can, uh, you know, the fungi occur and usually on a yearly basis. And we have a lot of uh, diseases and insects. So it's not, not really a, an easy uh, crop as far as management goes that you, you have a lot that goes into this investment and you want the fruits of your labor to pay off. And so you've put these uh, trees in the ground, you've waited years for them to become fruitful. And so you wanna be mindful of protecting the fruit and uh, have the best harvest you can. Then for, for peach leaf curl, if I remember right, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that's usually something like a chlorothalonil or a copper spray before bud swell or something like that. Because once those buds start opening up, that, that pathogen gets in there, right? That's, that's correct. All right. Um, and then two others, um, cedar, cedar apple rust and apple scab. What can we do this time of year for those? So cedar apple rust, you're going to be looking at the, the fact that you have uh, two hosts that cause that particular disease. And so you'll have your junipers and, you know, you could possibly eliminate some junipers out of your yard if you had those, but it can be a, a distance of, you know, about two miles that these uh, pathogens can blow in from your neighbor. So really, you know, just good management strategy of uh, adequate, uh, you know, a spray program to help protect that tree, but it can also in, infect those junipers. And so you can have kind of a cross uh, back and forth. Those uh, junipers will develop horns and then those uh, can explode in the, the springtime, especially in the rainy season. And uh, those will spread those spores and keep that infection going. And a lot of these uh, fungal infections, they have a primary uh, exposure, a primary infection, but then after the, the tree's been infected, there's secondary infections that occur. And so minimizing and mitigating these uh, early season infections is gonna help in the long run to prevent those secondary infections from occurring. And buying up all the land two miles around my apple tree and eliminating every single juniper there. That's a good strategy. I like that's the one I would go for. And then what about uh apple scab? Is there anything we can be doing now for that one? I th you know, I think you know those copper sprays and uh, fungicide sprays come in real. Uh, with a purpose during this time of the year, but you also got to think of some of these uh, sprays, you know, you got to be cautious of what you mix them with or what all you've used. And 
this is also a prime time for the dormant oil sprays because we have insects like uh, maybe some aphids, some scale, uh, different mites. And so they are living creatures, even though they may not seem like that, because, you know, if it's not in the crawler stage for scale, you don't see it crawling. But we have uh, some of these uh, scales have become, uh, you know, more of a problem like San Jose scale. And so to prevent these uh, from becoming more of a problem, you want to treat the trees and treat the entire tree, the entire canopy uh, with a dormant oil spray. But you have to be timely about that. So the proper temperature, you know, and spraying it to, and not mixing things like maybe a cap tan could uh, be harmful and have a, a negative effect if you mix some of these chemicals or apply them uh, within two weeks of one another. So Andrew, my head is spinning with all of these sprays and common names for chemicals and, and insects and disease. Is this how we keep our, our tree fruits healthy is spraying? Like, is there a cheat sheet to tell us when and how and what we spray? There is. Oh. So to keep, keep your head from spinning and to keep yourself focused, what you do is you go and get a spray guide. And commercially, there's a commercial spray guide, and we also have a homeowner spray guide or spray schedule. And so the schedule is based upon the phenology of the tree. And so when it is dormant, when it is in bud, uh, different, uh, you know, there's green tip for apples and pink and just various uh, phenological aspects that you're looking at. So then you have the different diseases or insects that you're targeting. And so you follow this according to when the, the proper time of the, the plant is to apply. And you just follow your labels on your insecticides or fungicides to find the perfect agreement for when you're going to be applying these chemicals to your trees. But it is, you know, a very timely and uh, you need to have things thought of ahead of time before you go venture into, you know, purchase, you have to have them purchased and there to be able to apply them. So just being mindful of what you're doing and having a schedule and investigating that ahead of time will pay off dividends in the long run. You also want to rotate your various chemicals. So you don't want to be applying the same fungicides over and over again because you build resistance and the same with insecticides. So having a proper rotation of some of these materials will, you know, keep you from developing resistance and keep those pests under check. Okay, so we've got our schedule for the fungicides and insecticides and everything, but what about mulch? Should we be mulching our fruit trees? Mulch can conserve moisture, but we also have problems with mulch is that there's a creature that's called the vole, and you may have heard of it before, and there's three different kinds that are very similar here in Illinois. And so those voles can kind of wreak havoc with your fruit trees. And so not only do you have to protect your trees from, you know, those biological elements, but we have these uh, mammals that are also a biological problem. And so protecting the trunk of the tree because the voles, they tend to chew and to damage uh, the roots and the, the trunks of various plants. And so providing a barrier around your tree will help that. But you know what I've seen here recently that's uh, really a, a problem for fruit trees are deer. Just coming home last night, it was like, I don't know, like I was inside the herd. There were so many deer as I was driving home. So I was like, man, this is crazy. Where are all these deer coming from? And it's like, it's like deer everywhere, but they're a, a real nuisance for uh, fruit trees. And so protecting your fruit trees and that investment from the deer, they do like to to eat the, the fruit trees and rub on and just cause major problems. So just be mindful of that. And 
What about another issue with fruit trees? So this person planted a peach tree five years ago and they've never had fruit um, or they don't have fruit every year. What could be wrong with this tree? Well, a lot of the times that you have a lack of fruit, it's because of pollination, poor pollination. But for peach trees, it's uh, the second year wood that carries that uh, you have your peaches on. So with that, if you prune too much, you're gonna be losing that wood and you're not gonna have uh, that to carry your crop. So an excessive amount of pruning could uh, be a problem there. Or, you know, if it was uh, other fruit trees besides the peach, the peach is pretty self-fertile, so you only really need one peach tree to be productive. But if it was an apple tree, you may need more than one uh, particular tree to be fruitful. And I'd say if you're peach, if you're further north, you may just get too cold and you get a, a late frost and kill all your flower buds too. Yeah, that would be the, the secondary cause of most of the problems. If you get above kind of where we're at in the central Illinois region, if you get further than, you know, about the Springfield area, you're definitely going to see a decline in the successfulness of having your peach trees. And even more so for things like nectarines or apricots that are damaged by those early spring frost and freezes. But there are some cultivars for peaches if you are in the north, like I believe it's Reliance or some of those cultivars that are more conducive to surviving in colder temperatures. Well, that was a lot of great information. So right now we should be looking at pruning get our pruners sharpened and start hacking away at our trees. Now the peach tree, I've been told you hack away at it until you can throw a cat through it without hitting a limb. Is that, that's the, that's the, at least the, what I've been told. Maybe a basketball is a better thing to throw through your tree. But did they tell you that you may want to wait because pruning can stimulate your uh, trees to wake up from that dormancy period Duh. so you may want to hold off as long as you can on your peach trees because the further you wait the less the less likely you are to have it wake up and then get hammered by the frost or freeze and then end up uh, losing your crop ah you lose hardiness maybe that's what i've been doing wrong all these years could be <laughs> well that's good to know all right so pruning Peach trees, hold off if you can. Uh, get your dormant oil sprays ready. Um, uh, start scouting. Look out for voles with a V. Um, and my goodness, a lot of great information. Andrew, thank you so much. No problem. Well, coming up now, right now, we have a special surprise segment um, for our four willing volunteers here um and so just i'll i'll slip you all a hundred dollar bill here later uh it's a virtual one see if i can find the emoji here um i have gone through some of our older episodes and i have plucked some questions to see how well you all were listening uh during these episodes so now these questions is for everyone i'm going to direct them to everybody um, feel free, everyone, to chime in. Um, so are you ready to play What Did You Learn on Good Growing? Ready as I'm shaking be. her head no. <laughs> so either, no, she's not ready to play, or no, she's learned nothing. As long as we don't have to form it in the form of a question. Oh, that was step two of my instruction. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, I'll scratch that part out. Okay. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be able to remember that part. <laughs> all right. This is not Jeopardy style then. Well, I've eliminated that rule. Okay. So question number one. Uh, I believe we talked about this with Grant McCarty. Um, name five food crops that can be perennials in the Illinois garden. 
Asparagus. We got one. Rhubarb. Strawberries. Two, three. We're doing fruits too? We're just doing vegetables. You tell me. What grapes. are the grapes to talk about? Brambles. Grapes and brambles. Is that five? That might be five. It's five. Yes. So we also talked, mentioned uh, things like the brambles, the raspberries, blueberries. Uh, we talked uh, just mentioning nuts, so our tree nuts and things like that. Um, so some of those maybe non-traditional perennial type plants, but um, you know, maybe you're thinking herbaceous perennials. I'm sorry, but we were talking things that come back every single year. All right, good warm-up question. Okay, now this next one. Name the plant that has the variety Pennsylvania Golden. Is it a potato? Nope. Just when we were talking to Grant? Nope. I, I can't say the name or you would know. <laughs> do, 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 do. Is that the version of the tree that Martha Smith loves so much? Birch. Oh, no, that's the European oh. filbert, the contorted... Okay. Uh, Filbert. Oh, I don't remember that one myself. <laughs> uh, I could give a hint. I could give a hint. Well, thank All you. Right. Yes. Yes, um, please. This is a crop that ripens in the fall. In apple. In Pumpkin Not apple. apple. No, I no. thought he said hemp there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> he did too. <laughs> what are you smoking? Uh, was it a male or a female that we talked to? It was a male. These do require multiple pollinizers. They their pollinators are flies. Um, I don't like that. Is it the corpse Papa. Flower? Papa, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. We talked with Doug Gooker and he let us know one of his favorite varieties of Papa was Pennsylvania Golden. All right. Whew. I'm sorry, we Doug. made it through. Huh? Well, in all honesty, I wasn't on that particular oh. podcast and i didn't go back and listen to it okay well Oops, my fault <laughs> that's and i'm looking at you too andrew you need to go and listen to all these episodes so uh even if you're not here all right now this is when uh i wasn't on the show ken katie wendy might have been there talked with richard henschel and richard shared his mowing mantra three things for mowing the lawn to give you one of the healthiest looking lawns without spraying a pesticide. Sharp mow blade. High, mow, mow often. often. Sharp and sharpen blade. your blades. That's it. Good job. I, how do I get confetti five, to rain down from the sky? Everyone <laughs> high fives. Good job. Good job. All right. Good. All right. Now, this was one we were talking. Um, I actually had a show with Andrew all about tomatoes a long time ago. The three different styles of trellising tomatoes. What are they? Basket weave. Right. So the basket weave. T-post trellis. That would count. And cages. cages or stakes. There, there's one more that we talked about. So we technically got your three. It's like a single stake. Yeah, kind of. That's it is the hanging string. It's like the string hanging or the string trellis system. The like single in a high, like in a high tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So yeah, it's kind of like a single T post, kind of a similar 
idea or concept behind that. So, all right, all right, we got that. Um, all right, I don't know if any of you remember talking with James Thury about turkeys, um, but he laid a lot of turkey knowledge on us that session. So my first question from that episode is, what do you call a female turkey? A hen. No, not quite. No. Dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I think Andrew's right. <laughs> Same male as a Tom, isn't it? Nope. Really? Mm -mm. Huh. The male's not? A female turkey is not a hen. They call female turkeys Jenny. Jenny's. Yep. Like the Jenny's. mule. <laughs> yes. Like a mule. <laughs> and then a male turkey is a um, or gobbler. A Jake. Jenny's and Jake's. I don't know where Tom Tom might be uh like a full-fledged, mature, robust male ready to mate. I don't know. <laughs> turkey Tom. Probably so that was children's yeah. book that, and then everybody just thought that was what it was. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> now here is some uh, another thing from James's episode with us. How long does it take to grow a turkey? What's a baby turkey called, though? By the way, is it a poult? A poult. Yes. How long does it take to go from poult? to a mature harvested turkey? Do we, get really... pardon? Do we get the pardon like the turkey does on this? Yeah. <laughs> I was I've really a curious multiple about choice. this. Um, Ken, it's your favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends, it depends. <laughs> it depends on breed. It depends on uh, management style. It can depend a bit on weather and stuff like that. So there's a lot of factors that go into how long it takes to raise a turkey. Typically, James said you're looking anywhere from five to six months, though. All right. This next one comes when we were talking with Philip Alberti, all about hemp. And according to the state of Illinois, what percent THC is a hemp plant considered marijuana what percent mm -hmm. isn't it like 0 0.05 it's low, or, oh low too no low. uh point one a little too high i mean you're not huh? <laughs> point five lower Lower? Lower. Is there a zero? Zero point yeah. zero? It's a zero, zero, seven. zero nine. Not quite. Seven. So, according. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> come on, okay. guys. What number am I thinking of? What number am I holding behind my back? I um zero so according. Seven. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no. All right. According to the state of Illinois, at least when we were talking with Philip, because this number might be changing, uh, it is 0.03% THC. Anything above that threshold is considered a marijuana plant and can no longer be considered hemp. All right. Almost done, folks. Don't worry. I know this is hurting. So, um, this is when we were talking with Dennis Bowman about drones. Is it legal for a drone to be flying over somebody else's property? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is because technically you do not own the airspace above treetop. Right. FAA does. And because of that, if a person is licensed to fly a drone with the FFA, F F A A, not <laughs> F F A. Um, they can legally fly their drone over your house. They can even legally take pictures of your property. Um, so that was some hot knowledge that Dennis dropped on us for the next episode. 
But it has, to be, right, above, last, it has to be above treetop. Has to be above treetop. So you need to plant some giant sequoias. There you go. Yes. <laughs> and have some awnings. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We need bigger awnings. I've said that for years, not only for drones, but just makes good architectural sense. Uh, and energy consumption. Yes. Energy consumption. That's key. Make sure that the awning is the correct slope and distance out from the house so that you can still get that southern exposure in the winter with the added shade blockage in the summer. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Got some hot <laughs> architectural knowledge here today. All right, last question. It's a simple, quick one. What is a whistle pig? Woodchuck. Groundhog. What, what is, oh, yeah, there you go. Ding, ding, ding. We got it. That's when we talked with Peggy Doty and we were uh, talking about what to do about groundhogs in the garden. So, well, thank you all for playing. I, as I was putting these together, I just realized how much like information, knowledge, how much, how many people we really have talked to in these last 100 episodes. So, I mean, we've, we put a lot out there. It's, it's been quite a ride. Yeah, I think Ken, next time we need to come with some questions for Chris. <laughs> I think Chris needs to be quizzed next time. <laughs> yes. What color shirt was Ken wearing in episode 54? <laughs> I think plaid. it'd be safe to say plaid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, everyone, this has been a great time. Here's to another 100 episodes. Uh, just thank you, Andrew, for being here today. Thank you, Wendy, for all the work that you do behind the scenes. Ken, Katie, thank you so much for being with us every single week. and diving into this topic of our choosing. Yeah, thank you all. Andrew, thank you for uh, for joining us this week and then Chris, Kidd, and Wendy for always being here every week to support the podcast to make this happen. Yes, thank you, Andrew, again for <clears throat> putting up with us and being on. Chris, Katie, Wendy, it's been fun. Let's do this again next week. <laughs> Oh, we shall do this again next week. We are not stopping and sitting on our laurels one bit. We are going to be chatting with state climatologist Trent Ford all about climate change and how it is affecting our plants and our gardens and vegetables, everything out there. So, folks, you don't want to miss that show. It's going to be a fun one. Listeners, couldn't have gotten to 100 episodes without you. Thank you so much for everything, sticking around with us and doing what you do best. That is listening. And same goes for you, YouTube watchers. Uh, thank you for watching us. And as always, keep on growing.